1195 Bansal College, Mandi Deep, Bhopal. Over to you. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. This is Rajiv Dwedi from Bansal Engineering College, Mandi Deep. I would like to a question, sir. Sir, so far we have discussed energy, heat, and work. Heat and work both are path function, and energy we have studied. Uh, we have concluded it is a point function or state function. While heat and work both are transient form of energy. Why? Could you explain, sir? See, it's not proper to say that heat and work are transient forms of energy. Heat and work are interactions. They are energies in transit. Okay, so energy is something which belongs to either system A or system B. Heat and work are energies during the process or during the interaction when they come out of system A and system B. Okay, it's like a transaction. For example, the money which you have in your bank is the storage. That's like the equivalent to energy in the bank. The money which you have in your purse is a another system, another storage of energy. If you take out some money from the bank and put it in your purse, there is a transaction. Money has come out of uh, the bank. Your dravya or your property in the bank has reduced. Your property in your pocket or in your purse has increased, and because there is a transaction of withdrawal of money from the bank. Our Q and W are these types of transactions. Okay? You cannot say that system A has so much of heat or so much of work stored in it. What is stored in it is simply energy. Similarly, system B has its own storage of energy. When you take out energy from system A and provide it to system B, there is an energy transaction. Thermodynamics tells us that there are two types of transactions, the work type of transaction and the heat type of transaction. So, energies are energies, uh, heat and work are energies in transit, nothing more. 1150 South Sushila Godavat Institution, Kolhapur, over to you. Sir, uh, we are already discussed that, uh, example number 7. So, can you change this medium like uh, uh, air gun replaced by the thermal gun. So, situation is difference, differ or not? I do not understand what you mean by a thermal gun. Sir, question number 7 is there will be medium is air, air, air right. gun. So, replace a thermal gun. So, situation is differ or not? Yes, it will be different because what you have been told or what you have been asked to do is only the part which is the sort of a following part. I say that in the chamber you already have air or a gas at a certain pressure, P, I think P c right and a temperature T c, this is specified. The actual thing in a, uh, not in an air gun, but in an actual thing in an air gun is instead of air there, there is a mixture of uh, the appropriate gunpowder or whatever is the fuel, fuel and oxidant and there will be a trigger by which a reaction will take place and energy will be released. That means, the chemical energy will get converted into thermal internal energy and that energy will be used to um, cause the movement of the bullet. The second part would be similar expansion, okay, but the first part or precursor to this would be creation in that chamber of a situation which is at a high pressure P c and maybe at a high temperature T c. What we want really is a high pressure, high temperature is incidental, even if it is not high temperature it does not matter. But because we want the bullet to accelerate, we want P c to be as high as possible. Over to you. Temperature change, uh, changes from 50 to 600, okay. right. So, right. it is a situation like that expression of a volume. So, we are all uh, uh, obtain this ex expression of volume in air, air gun. So, thermal gun also changes that? Yes, the some expressions will change because the uh, it will not be air, it will be a complicated mixture of gases. So, the properties will be different. 
and because the properties will be different and maybe they are functions of temperature. So, our P V raise to gamma type of situation we may not be able to get at it will be a more complicated expression, but yes the process of uh, determination remains more or less similar, but because of the variation of properties and uh, mixture present you may have to integrate it out numerically rather than analytically. Is there another question? Uh, good evening sir, uh, sir while explaining about the first law of thermodynamics you have given the example of the brake and the drum system right okay i think you are hearing sir and in that brake and drum system you consider two boundaries one uh, before the outer surface of the brake drum, uh, brake shoe and one below the circumference of the drum right and another one exactly at the interface of the brake shoes outer surface and uh, uh, exactly the circumference of the brake drum ok sir right. and uh, here the area of contact is only partial of the circumference mm. then why we have to consider the whole circle as the boundary sir and uh, uh, another thing here one system is sir one system is constant that is brake shoe and the drum is rotating and uh, like this how we are calculating the thermodynamic uh, calculations in these type of situations, sir. See, uh, this situation was provided to get your thought process going. I am not providing any computational thing, okay. And I just sketched a part of the boundary, but actually, you should sketch the complete boundary. I just showed you a break, a shoe liner, or a break, but if you consider a rope dynamometer that rope will con, uh, you know uh, surround the uh, drum completely. If you are more comfortable with that situation, you can use that situation. That situation I just sketched to demonstrate to you that in the in one case where the boundary of the system is totally within the drum, you have one type of interaction. If the drum is rotating and the brake is trying to stop it, if the boundary is totally within the drum, you can show that it is definitely and completely a work interaction. If the boundary is outside the drum, say inside the rope or inside the brake liner, one or more, how, how about how many, whatever is the number, then you can definitely demonstrate that it is a purely heat interaction. But if you insist on putting the boundary exactly at the interface, it will be very difficult for you to say whether it is purely a work interaction or purely a heat interaction. This is just to impress on you that a small relocation of the boundary of a system, redefining a system can change the type of interaction completely from the one type to another type. This is the simplest example and I like this example because we have seen this situation in our laboratories, IC engine or fluid power laboratories, but there are many such examples. Okay, sir. And uh, practical application of this concept is uh, in the railways, where we are using the sand, fine sand, between that brake shoe, brake shoe and the drum. And what is that concept? Uh, what is the part of that sand in the thermodynamic processor? How we can imply that, that into is, the that 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 is that sand essentially there is used for increasing the friction. Okay. However the since the sand comes in and some sand gets thrown out you are adding more complication because then it becomes an open thermodynamic system the brake liner may be a closed thermodynamic system the brake drum will be a closed thermodynamic system but the sand particles or the collection of sand or even the oil film on it if there is any oil or lubricant or whatever uh, material which you have will be an open thermodynamic system and analysis of that will require not just the principles of thermodynamics, but that also of fluid mechanics, material science and whatever you have. Okay. Thermodynamics is a subset of physics, so there are certain types of problems which thermodynamics does not uh, look at or is not capable of looking at. Yesterday somebody mentioned that electrical resistor, if it is not cooled 
and if its temperature rises the resistance value of the resistance may change yes but then how do we cool it that is not a part of thermodynamics that is a part of heat transfer and if it is liquid cooled fluid mechanics is also involved. What we are learning it here are basic principles of thermodynamics. So, we should accept the fact that there are certain issues which the science of thermodynamics does not look at leaves it to other sciences like fluid mechanics, heat transfer, combustion and all that. Over to you. Okay, sir. Uh, last question. Uh, sir, in future I am planning to uh, proceed with the concept of environmental protection. In that case, how I can go with the thermodynamic concepts to protect the nature and uh, in what field I can do the research? It's a very general question unless we, we take this offline and I will not discuss it here. Okay? Since that was your last question, I will say over and out. Let me go to some other center. 1006 NIT Tiruchirappadi, over to you. Uh, this is related to uh, problem number 1.6. The equation of the process TV power gamma is equal to constant that we have to prove. For that uh, we have started with Q is equal to delta E plus W and in differential form we have written as dQ is equal to du plus dW. Then dQ is written as C into dT is equal to Cv dT into dW then uh, it will come in the form of Cp, sorry, C, uh, C minus Cv into dT is equal to Tw. Hmm. Then in order to prove that uh, the process is PV power K is equal to constant, we are unable to process, proceed further. Okay, I think you are missing out on using the ideal gas equation of state. Uh, you are right when you write, this is 1.6, uh, you write, see our uh, Differential form would be dQ is dE plus dW. Okay. Uh, you consider first dE is dU, that is the assumption, one assumption. Second assumption is dW is dW expansion, that is another assumption. With these two assumptions, you will get if you divide throughout by mass of the system, you will get dQ equals dU plus, because of this dW expansion, this will become PdV. You are right, since it is an ideal gas, you can write this at Cv dT. So, here the ideal gas is used and dQ is given at C dT. So, C dT is Cv dT plus PdV. Okay? Now, all that you have to do is this is one equation. The second equation you use is P V equals R T. So, since you want a relation between uh, P and uh, V, P V raise to key, using this replace D T by something into D P and something into D V. Then collect terms and you will get P V raise to K is constant. From this, you can calculate for example, P d V plus V d P, if you differentiate this will become R d T. So, wherever you see d T here, here and here, replace it by 1 over R into P d V plus V d P and you will get an expression containing only d P and d V. And when you integrate it out, you have to say that uh, I am integrating because I am assuming the process to be a quasi static process. So, that is another assumption which you need to make. 1079 Gita Institute of Management and Technology Kurukshetra. I ask you a question that at absolute zero temperature, uh, the volume of a substance becomes zero. It is possible, sir. See, uh, absolute zero is a um, is something which is a thermodynamic. One can call singularity. After doing uh, the second law, we will realize that absolute zero is a temperature which we can only think about. We can never reach. And uh, our uh, behavior of systems becomes 
more and more uh, complex as we go to lower and lower temperatures, particularly near 0 Kelvin. And hence, uh, in fact, uh, material properties become so important, although laws of thermodynamics are still applicable, but there is no point in discussing anything at absolute 0, because uh, absolute 0 is as distant as is infinite. It turns out to be 0 the way we have defined our scales of temperature. Okay, it is a ratio scale, so somewhere you will have a 0, but we could have uh, defined it the other way round and then what is absolute 0 could have become infinitely large temperature. Okay, so, there is nothing special about or uh, nothing to be discussed about absolute 0, that is a temperature to be only thought about, we will not reach it in practice. We will reach micro kelvins, milli kelvins, maybe even uh, nano kelvins, but reaching absolute 0 is an impossible task. Over. Absolute 0, uh, you mean to say, I think it should be, or it is, you mean to say, sir, it is approximately 0, that is, it is tending to approaching to almost 0 temperature. Is it, sir? See, as you approach lower and lower temperatures, as you go to 0 Kelvin, the state of any substance depends on its inherent properties. For example, I doubt whether anything remains in the vapor form or the gaseous form. Everything liquefies, helium liquefies, hydrogen liquefies. So, measurement of temperature, everything becomes an extremely difficult task by itself and that uh, you know near uh, 0 Kelvin or very low temperature cryogenics is a field by itself. The basic principles of thermodynamics are still applicable provided there are no quantum effects. Okay. But uh, in a basic engineering thermodynamics course, uh, it is not within our scope nor is it possible for us to discuss details of the physics of temperature near 0 Kelvin. Over and out, let me go somewhere else. 1278 SDM Institute of Technology Ujire, Karnataka, over to you. Uh, hello sir, uh, this is Lavakumar from uh, SDMIT. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any other interaction? in the universe other than eat and work? No, I will repeat the question and it is an excellent question. The question is, is there any other interaction in the universe other than heat and work? Well, a very faithful answer to that is we do not know, but the way we have defined heat interaction as something other than the work interaction, there is an inherent assumption there that any energy interaction other than the work interaction is a heat interaction. That assumption seems to work and that assumption seems to work exceptionally well, because not only do we have heat interaction being defined and we have number of predictions based on the first law of thermodynamics. The heat interaction also enters into the picture in the detailed formulation of the second law of thermodynamics and many of the predictions created using the second law of thermodynamics either by itself or in combination with first law have turned out to be very reliable predictions. Hence the basic assumption that the any interaction is either work or heat seems to be a true assumption. Apart from that, but I agree that it is an assumption, it is a premise and we believe in it because we have not yet found anything which is neither work nor heat, but something else. If we discover something else, we will naturally we will have to modify our first law and if that third interaction is say x interaction, then just like second law, maybe there will be a third law or a fourth law or a fifth law to provide further details of that x. And when that happens, perhaps similar to entropy, we may even have another property associated with it. Over to you. Okay, sir, that is it. Thank you. 
over and out 1016 KJ Somaiya College Mumbai good evening sir i am akash from remote center kj somya college of engineering mumbai i have two questions my first question is basically related with f problem number f 1.a in this problem the time is given volume also given and pressure is given in such type of cases how can we justify the value of delta e 1.8 is the question you are talking about what's the issue the time is given volume is given volume is 15 liter and pressure also given 1 bar hmm and is in such type of cases how can we justify the value of delta e yeah this is essentially a, actually this is not a first law problem it should have gone into perhaps the work interaction we only have to determine the work interactions here it's a two work interaction problem and one interaction is the charging of the battery the other interaction is the change in volume which is to be modeled as the displacement of an atmosphere so in f1.8 let us say that we will consider model it like this you have an electrolyte which is maybe partly liquid partly gas but our system is the whole system exposed to the atmospheric pressure and there are electrodes and what we are told is uh, the potential across this is 24 volts and the current drawn is 1 ampere and 15 liter of gas is evolved so the delta v will be 15 liters and the atmospheric pressure is not given or is it given ha one bar p atmosphere is 1.0 bar okay sketch the system diagram sketch the appropriate process diagram there will be uh, two process diagrams system diagram is already drawn one process diagram would be uh, p against v the constant pressure is p atmospheric and the v will go from some initial volume to some final volume you can assume under quasi static assumption i have sketched it and let the initial volume be v1 the final volume v2 is v1 plus 15 liters this is one part of the process diagram the other part of the process diagram can be plotted against time so from 0 to 24 time in hours and out here you have the potential e or v and the current i 0 to 24 hours we are given that the e remains uh, fixed at how many volts 24 volts and i remains fixed at 1 ampere this is a simple problem if you take a real cell maybe initially the um, voltage is slightly lower as it comes to full charge the slowly the voltage will balance to its correct value initially the current will be large later on as it gets fully charged the current is likely to drop but it's good you brought this to my notice i think we should move this to the work interaction part rather than the first law part because first law is not involved in this so i will write here only work interactions over to you is basically related with the uh, cyclic process formula cyclic integration of dw is equal to cyclic integration of dq so what is the condition of this formula and where this condition is applied this condition is only apply for close path of adiabatic work transfer or other than that no i think i have uh, 
discuss this earlier somewhere in the morning. The first law for a closed system is always q equals delta e plus w for any process. Now, if process is a cycle, that means initial state is the final state. Hence, for such a process delta e is 0. So, for a cycle q equals w, but since this is for a cycle, we should really write q cycle is w cycle. So, that the condition that this is true for a cycle is also included in the expression itself. And of course, if the cycle is represented by a set of processes over which you can integrate the interactions, that means it is an almost or appropriately quasi static cycle, then you can write this as cyclic integral of dq with cyclic integral of dw. This circle over the integration sign automatically indicates that it is a cycle, cyclic integral over a closed loop in the state space. 1088 KK Wag Institute Nashik, over to you. Uh, temperature is the label given to the isotherms at which the interaction stop, but according to the radiation theory, uh, every system about 0 K interact means emit radiation. So, uh, interaction stop or it is continuous. You bring in the idea of radiation. Remember that. Uh, the phenomena of radiation like other phenomena of physics is not inconsistent with the uh, principles of thermodynamics. So, zeroth law and radiation they live very well with each other. When you have two systems which are isothermal, they will not interact by radiation, even by radiation. Uh, if the temperatures are equal or if they are isothermal. The radiation tells us that if they are um, uh, isothermal, well radiation says that any body emits it. Radiation only talks of emission, the basic uh, laws of radiation only talk of emission, but we also have emission from the two systems. So, the net effect will be 0. In fact, this idea is used in uh, radiation theory. Uh, you would have uh, come across it in the uh, your heat transfer course when you study radiation in any in some detail that this is used in what is uh, called the Kirchhoff's principle or the Kirchhoff's laws for radiation. It is using this idea that uh, at same temperature there is thermal equilibrium net heat transfer has to be 0. So, that idea is used to derive uh, relations like emissivity equals absorptivity in thermal equilibrium, when the whole thing is in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So, uh, radiation is perfectly consistent with zeroth law or zeroth law is perfectly consistent with radiation. Over to you. There is one question, one more question sir. Uh, this is regarding, uh, just I could not understand why Kelvin scale has started from minus 273 degree Celsius. What is the reason? The Kelvin scale has not started from minus 273 or minus 273.15 Kelvin. Kelvin scale has only one fixed point which is defined and that is the triple point of water 273.16 Kelvin. Based on that, it is obvious that uh, if you go to situations which are purportedly lower and lower temperatures. That means, you find out systems or your thermometer consisting of your gas goes to lower and lower PV values, you will go to lower and lower temperatures on the Kelvin scale. And naturally, 0 is something which is very attractive, but as I have discussed something that 0 is just a mathematical oddity. Uh, the importance of Kelvin scale will be clear when we derive a thermodynamic Kelvin scale after the second law and then using the properties of ideal gas, 
and the Carnot theorem we prove that the ideal gas scale and the Kelvin the thermodynamic scale are essentially equivalent and that means the thermodynamic temperature and the ideal gas temperature can be considered to be numerically and quantitatively the same. And based on that we will show that it is virtually impossible to reach the 0 Kelvin temperature. Okay. So, that is a side tracking, but the fact remains that the Kelvin scale does not start from 0 Kelvin or minus 273.16 Kelvin. The Kelvin scale starts and has only one fixed point and that is plus 273.16 Kelvin. Over and out. 1, 2, 3, 5, Dr. Mahalingam College, Pollachi, Tamil Nadu. Over to you. Uh, Sendil Kumar from uh, Mahalingam College of Engineering and Technology. Can we say the, uh, the, the concentration from one area to other area can be dealt with chemical thermodynamics? Uh, can we say the, the, that, that chemical uh, transfer is as an interaction other than the heat and work interaction? See the question asked is in chemical thermodynamics when a reaction takes place, uh, one component gets replaced by another component, products gets replaced by reactants. Okay. That is not that happens within a system, it only changes the form of energy from the chemical energy to some other form of energy it does not lead to any work interaction. A state changes because now the internal components of energy had changed, but there is no chemical work interaction involved out there. Okay. This is a very simple analogy of this is you consider a your uh, say a projectile as a system, a ball thrown up into the air. The ball has maybe thermal internal energy, but it has also a component known as gravitational potential energy and it has another component known as the kinetic energy. Okay. If you assume that the thermal internal energy of the ball does not change, a solid ball the thermal internal energy would essentially be a function of temperature. As it goes up and down, all that will happen is uh, the as it goes up the kinetic energy will reduce, the gravitational potential energy will go up and as it comes down, the gravitational potential energy will reduce, the mechanical kinetic energy will go up. Uh, there will be some interplay between the two components of energy, but there will be no work done. There is no work done because there is no system to provide the work interaction or there is no system to uh, receive the work interaction. Remember that for work and heat, two systems must be involved. If only one system is involved, whatever happens within it is only reallocation of energy. It is not any work or heat interaction. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And one more question. Sir, some books refers to uh, the third law of thermodynamics, but uh, I am not sure what is called third law and some, uh, some books, the textbooks refers to the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, can you explain about the third law of thermodynamics or somewhat? I will not say anything about the third law of thermodynamics because we do not have to study anything like the third law of thermodynamics. We, we have three laws, they are called 0th, 1st and 2nd and that is it. In mechanical engineering, at least routine traditional mechanical engineering and basic engineering thermodynamics, we do not have to study the third law of thermodynamics and we do not uh, currently have any applications uh, which require anything other than the three laws of thermodynamics. Over. 1166 Bhilai Institute of Technology Durg. Over to you. In question number 10, uh, we had calculated the change in volume, change in internal energy and change in enthalpy, but uh, the net work done and the expansion work done, the expansion work done is coming out to be 0, am I right? Expansion work done is coming out to be 0, why? Coming out to as the volume V1 and V2 are 0, equal. The pressure is half, 
temperature is half. So, V 1 equals V 2 that does not mean that the expansion work is 0, because the process is suspected to be non quasi static. That is a very important information and important hint given here. And in this uh, actually I think F 1.10 uh, please talk to your coordinator, this F1.10 1, F1 is the illustrative solution of this including the thought processes is uploaded on the coordinators Moodle. Your coordinator should be able to show that to you. It is very clear in that how the expansion work is calculated. Expansion work will be 0 only if the volume remains unchanged and the process is quasi static throughout at least from that point of view on the P V diagram the process is quasi static. For example, if it were to be given a rigid container, we are not given in a that there is a rigid container or anything of that sort here. 1089 K L E college Chikodi over to you. Uh, sir, uh, this is uh, regarding to that uh, uh, modes of work transfers, uh, uh, because we have uh, different types of uh, modes of work transfers, is there any standardized uh, methodologies like uh, coefficients, constants and any physical significances uh, to relate these uh, modes of this work transfers? Well, there is no standardized method of doing things pertaining to different modes of work transfer that was your question. Remember work is actually a primitive, but we have to treat it with respect because in thermodynamics we have to define the heat interaction and we define the heat interaction as the interaction other than work and hence we have to be perfect in our understanding of what un, uh, work interaction is. That we did by providing a proper operational definition of work in our scheme of things. Okay. But the details of work interaction, it all depends on other branches of physics. Tomorrow if physics realizes some other type of work interaction, all that we will do is check from our point of view whether it is really a work interaction. If it is a work interaction, we will assimilate it into our sigma w, nothing special about it. Over to you. Uh, sir, another one question. Uh, it is uh, uh, related to the black hole, sir, in the inverse. Uh, actually, where that uh, science uh, that uh, usually the thermodynamics has been stopped, uh, uh, any relations uh, to find that interactions in that black holes, uh, we are very much interested to know that one, sir. See, black holes are uh, astronomical entities. Uh, thermodynamics is applied to them with appropriate modifications because out there the gravitational fields are very strong, perhaps the quantum effects are also very strong. Our uh, well thermodynamics is applied, but with appropriate safeguards and modifications. I am not an expert in cosmology, forget uh, that of black holes. You should talk to uh, a friend in the physics department who is conversant with uh, general relativity and uh, cosmology, uh, some, somebody who appreciates the work of such people as uh, uh, Chandrasekhar, Narlikar, uh, Hawking and all that and uh, maybe he should be able to explain it to you in a proper way, in an understandable way. Over. 1286 UV Patel College of Engineering, Kherwa, Gujarat. Over to you. Sir, uh, we are having a problem with uh, 1.3. Uh, we are having problem in finding the temperature T2. Uh, we are having one way that Q equals uh, mcp delta T. So, sir, can you please uh, throw some light on that? See, F1.3 is actually a straightforward problem. We have a closed system. It executes a constant pressure process. Initial state is given. Heat interaction is given. We have to determine the change in temperature, change in enthalpy, change in internal energy and work done. 
assume the air to be an ideal gas with the properties given. Okay. We can sketch the system as a gas in a cylinder piston arrangement. So, we can say that we have 2 kg of air and it is going to expand. So, there is going to be a W expansion. There is no mention of a stirrer, there is no mention of an electrical work, the only other interaction mentioned is Q and Q is given to be heat addition of 450 kilojoules. So, Q is 450 kilojoules. Uh, initial condition 2.5 bar undergoes a constant pressure process. So, this pressure is 2.5 bar. Okay. The process diagram would look something like this. On the P V plane at a constant pressure of 2.5 bar, the process will go from some initial state 1 to a final state 2. This will be V 1, this will be V 2. We are asked to assume air to be an ideal gas. It is given that air is ideal gas. Molecular weight is given, C V is given as a constant. So, it is a ideal gas with constant specific heats. Given the molecular weight, because M is given and C V is given, from which you can calculate R and C P as needed. Okay. Now, the way to proceed is start with first law. Anyway, we have to determine interaction, so first law will be involved. So, we start with first law Q equals delta E plus W. Okay. First step assume delta E is delta U, there is no mention of any change in height or any movement. Assume W is W expansion. Okay. So, this becomes delta U plus W expansion. Now, delta U is simply, okay, we will leave it at delta U just now, we need not expand it, but now W expansion is integral P d V for which you will have to assume it to be a quasi static process, but since it is given to be a constant temperature process it follows that at least for the integration of P d V for that purpose it can be considered as quasi static from state 1 to state 2. Then because pressure is constant you can write this as P integral d V or P delta V. Okay. So, the next step is this becomes delta U plus P delta V, but again Again, since P is constant, you can write this as delta P V and then you can write this as delta H. So, we have ended our first law formulation as Q equals delta H. Q is given, so we know delta H and because it is an ideal gas with constant specific heat, this becomes M into C p into T 2 minus T 1. M is given, C p can be calculated from here R and C p have been calculated. T 1 is known, so we can determine T 2. Once you get T 2, everything else falls in line. We have temperature, once you get T 2, well, Q itself here turns out to be the change in enthalpy. The change in internal energy will be calculated as M C V delta T and the work done will be calculated as P delta V. Or if you want, we can go back since you have calculated delta U and if you have calculated Q, 
you can calculate it w as q minus delta u. You do not have to do p delta u. That will be a simpler calculation. Over to you. Yes, sir. My next question is regarding the quasi static process. Having known the concept of quasi static that at each and every point the state points are uniquely defined. So, uh, with this concept, can we say that having known one position, can we predict the future position? Uh, no, quasi-static does not mean predictability. Predictability requires that we know what the interactions are. For example, you take this, uh, this problem itself, F1.3. We are given that it is a constant pressure process. It is not given quasi-static, but we can even assume it to be quasi-static. But that does not tell us what the final position is. For final position is we know, need to know the interaction. If you change Q, you change the final position. Okay, you change Q, you change T2. So, that way quasi-static does not mean predictability. Quasi-static makes the process analytically simple. because direct functional relationships, however complicated, are available for the process. A non-quasi-static means we do not even know what exactly the value of pressure, temperature, etcetera is. So, you cannot do any calculations, detailed calculations. We are not in the domain of uh, calculus with a non-quasi-static process. Over. Then, sir, how does uh, this concept helps in uh, uh, establishing some process details as if uh, for uh, adiabatic PV raised to power gamma is constant or for some polytrop polytropic PV raised to power n is equals constant. Because yeah, until we cannot establish uh, this uh, quasi static uh, details, then how can we establish that thing? See, uh, the quasi static idea comes from mathematics. See, in mathematics, you can integrate a function f of x dx only when, say from a to b, only when given any x between a and b, okay, a unique value of f of x is defined. This is what we mean by quasi-static. At every location, every stage during a process, the situation of the system, the state in which the system exists is defined. And hence, we can do manipulations like integration, differentiation on that uh, process or part of that process. Quasi-static only means that the state is defined or is definable all through the process. 1, 2, 6, 0, SKN Sivagad College of Engineering, Pandarpur, Maharashtra. Over to you. So, my question is, sir, uh, in problem number 6, the heat transfer during quasi static process. So, here my question is, uh, what will be the effect if process is changed from quasi static to reversible and irreversible? I will not take that question because uh, we have not yet discussed what we mean by a reversible process or an irreversible process. I will leave it at that. Okay? We need to have this process quasi static, otherwise, we have to remain at the DPDV level from dp, dv, etcetera, if you want to integrate it and show it that p v raised to k is constant, in that case we need to assume it to be quasi-static. Okay, reversibility is not included here. Reversibility will come in when we start studying the second law of thermodynamics. Over. Okay, sir. Uh, for next problem, problem number 7, uh, if we will take with the one case, that uh, one bullet is impacting on material and uh, the material, the target material, if we will take one case is wood and another case is it is steel. In one case it is happening that indentation will happen and in second case uh, only a deflection will happen. So, how can we give the explanation with thermodynamics? 
well you have an interaction and along with thermodynamics you will in this case you will have to include the conservation of momentum also the wood being softer the bullet will get you know embedded in that wood so there will be one way uh, the trans momentum transfer will take place but because it is embedded the final state will have some commonality for example the velocity of the bullet and the velocity of the block of wood will be the same whereas if it's a steel block you will have more of an elastic uh, 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 interaction and maybe the bullet will ricochet from that uh, steel block so the final energy forms will be different in the first case with wood there will be hardly any kinetic energy of the bullet whereas uh, in the second case the bullet will still continue to have some kinetic energy if you consider the appropriate components of kinetic energy and other forms of energy first law can be very properly applied to these two cases over and out but just before i go out i want to ask you one question i think this center uh, your center 1260 has been noted as a center in which there is a possibility of 200 candidates is that true do you have a big hall for 200 people to sit down 35 registrations are there but uh, actual candidates which are attending these are 30 candidates okay but what is the maximum number of candidates you can handle in principle uh, we are having capacity 200 our classroom is having capacity of 200 sitting capacity and this is uh, our computer not this not center, this classroom is 60 uh, sits uh, what is the uh, capacity this is not classroom this, this is uh, computer center so computer center has a computer capacity computer center is having capacity of 60 sits okay thank you very much over and out 1126 vignan institute of technology and science nalgonda over to you uh i am asking question 1.7 okay if i take a chamber as a system uh, there is a no need of coming uh, the word atmospheric pressure there because uh, uh, they they told that the process is an adiabatic we know that uh, in adiabatic process the work done is e1 v1 minus p2 v2 by gamma minus 1 the work done equal to force into the velocity uh, distance that has moved by the bullet Uh, if, uh, if the force is considered as mass into acceleration, okay, uh, we know this uh, m b square will come as a uh, work done during an adiabatic process called m b square, and uh, we can find out velocity by using this one. There is no uh, word come across as an ambient pressure there. That's not true. Okay, see uh, the gas in the chamber as it expands through the barrel does work on the bullet. but remember that the bullet is also affected by the atmospheric pressure on the other side so the if you take the bullet as a system there are in principle three interactions one with the barrel one with the gas in the chamber which is expanding and one is the atmosphere which is being pushed back it is given to us that there is no interaction between the bullet and the the barrel it's given to be frictionless we make an assumption that there is no thermal interaction also okay so the two interactions remain one is the one with the gas which as you said is the equivalent of the gas expanding adiabatically maybe finally you get the formula as p1 v1 minus p2 v2 by n minus 1 but you can't neglect the other interaction which is the atmospheric interaction so the volume of the barrel or volume displaced by the uh, volume of the atmosphere displaced by the bullet multiplied by the atmospheric pressure that will be the work done uh, against the atmosphere by the bullet and that will have to be included otherwise the you will over predict to that extent the muzzle velocity of the bullet over my system is a chamber sir yeah so if your system is the chamber not directly, what happens the pressure yeah. is not directly interacting with the chamber See, the chamber is not interacting with the atmosphere i agree the chamber is interacting only with the bullet but the bullet in uh, in turn is interacting with the atmosphere 
So, if we want the final state of the bullet that is its final velocity, we will have to consider all interactions of the bullet. The answer which you will get without looking at the atmosphere will be will perhaps be the correct answer if uh, the gun is fired outside the atmosphere of the earth in the vacuum of space. So, there is no atmospheric pressure out there or hardly any atmospheric pressure, ambient pressure out there. Over. Uh, can you explain uh, about the basic difference between a quasi static process and non quasi static process? I think I have explained to that. Again, I will uh, do this and perhaps this will be or maybe I will take one more center. If I execute a process from a initial state 1 to a final state 2 and during the process I observe the system and I find that at any stage during the process, whichever way it goes, I can determine exactly what the state of the system is, then this is a quasi static process. I know what is the value of x1, what is the value of y1 or p, v, t, whichever three dimension, four properties, all properties are known. So, I can plot this route which the process takes in all detail. Okay. But if I am unable to do this, I will take an extreme case of uh, uh, process in which case I observe the system to be initially at 1, then the process begins, but during the process I am unable to make unique measurements of the properties. It could be you know there is no proper word which we can use, the process is so jerky the measurements are so diffused, so uncertain if you try to measure that I, I dare not plot even one point in between. But then after some time everything settles down and I can confirm that the system has reached uh, state 2, because at that stage I can determine all the properties of the system and I can create plot the point 2 of the state. In which case all that I would say is that initially I was at 1, finally I was at 2, I do not know anything in between. Okay. So, but I want to represent it somehow, so all that I will do is I will draw a line joining 1 and 2, any line, but a dotted line. This is just by convention, a dotted line indicates that the position of the line and the meaning of the intermediate point is meaningless location of the intermediate points is meaningless. I am just joining it as a connecting link between 1 and 2. It is just a symbolic link, it's, it does not have any physical significance except that it starts at 1 and ends at 2. Yeah, uh, work done equal to integral PDV, can we apply this equation for non quasi static? In principle yes, but since pressure is not known during the process, how will you do the integration? That is the issue that we get end up with. In principle, integral PDV is still applicable, but we cannot really apply it, we cannot integrate it out. It is like saying, you know, an extreme case is a pathologically uh, a funny mathematical function, which say it is defined between 0 and 1. If I tell you that my function f of x is exactly equal to 1 when x is less than or equal to 0.5 and is exactly equal to 0 for x greater than 0.5. I think you can integrate it? Yes. But now I make it more complicated. I say that look, my function is 1 if the intermediate x is a rational number and my function is 0 if the intermediate x is ir irrational number. Okay. Now try to integrate it from 0 to 1, a non quasi static process is something like this. At every x you can say well it is defined, but try to plot it on the x y, you just cannot plot it, because you do not know where to plot 1, you do not know where to plot 0. So, there is although you can say that well integration the limit as limit of the sum etcetera or even the area under the curve, since the curve cannot be perfectly defined here you just cannot do the integration.
I will just take one more center and then we will call it quits. Let us go to the capital of India. So, I am trying to latch on to 1238 Maharaja Agrasen Institute of Technology in Rohini, Delhi. Over to you. Sir, I am De Deshdeep Kambir. Sir, my question is, the first question, that uh, 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 yesterday you talked about the rudimentary system. So, and uh, you give an example that uh, that uh, the glass thermometer, that is a rudimentary system. But in case of the glass thermometer, uh, it is the uh, mercury column that moves. And there is an expansion of that. So how would you explain that, uh, that as, uh, as a rudimentary system, sir? Okay. The question asked is, yesterday I proposed the mercury in glass thermometer as a rudimentary system. The question is, since the mercury column expands, there must be some work done, how can that be a rudimentary system. Remember that the mercury column and whatever is the free space above the mercury, whether vac vacuum or anything else, is all inside the system. For work to be done, we have to have two systems involved. And where are the two systems we are talking about? If you consider the mercury capillary itself or the mercury part itself as a system, then we are not perhaps looking at a rudimentary system. Okay? But if we are looking at a thermometer as a whole, then the capillary, the mercury is something which is inside the system. All that we can observe is the length of the mercury thread in the capillary. When it expands, it does not do any work. If it works, even if there is a gas and it compresses it, that remains inside. I cannot extract that work and try to raise a weight with that. And hence, there is no work interaction involved or there is no two-way work interaction involved. And hence, that mercury in glass thermometer is a rudimentary system. I hope you understand. Over. Question. Yeah, yes. This is the second question. So, there is a question with the muzzle vapors which is there. Uh, that uh, there is a compressed air, air gun. Yes, 1.7. Yes, sir. So, in that case, uh, you have considered the bullet as the, you are the system and then you solved it. it. Uh, let me explain. This is pertaining to uh, exercise F1.7. It seems to be very interesting to many of you, uh, no doubt. I am happy about that. The first system we considered is the gas which was initially inside the chamber, not the chamber itself. We have to know what is the content of the system. The content of the system was the gas inside the chamber and as the bullet moves, the gas expands through the barrel because the bullet acts as a piston. I think that hint is also given here. Okay. Assume that the bullet behaves like a leak proof frictionless piston. So, the gas or the air in this, this expands, so it does work on the bullet. So, if my system 1 is the gas, system 2 is bullet, there is a work interaction between system 1 and system 2. Okay? Now, that interaction we can compute till the bullet clears the barrel. The second interaction is uh, the second system which I considered in the later part is the bullet itself because we want to determine the muzzle velocity or the final velocity or the exit velocity of the bullet. So, that is a property of the bullet since the initial state of the bullet is known at rest, the final state of the bullet is at velocity v naught. We have to determine the change of state of the bullet and that means I have to consider the bullet as a system. Now, the bullet as a system, as I discussed earlier, has a number of interactions. One interaction is the work done by the bullet on the gas. This will be a negative number and will be equal in magnitude to the work done by the gas on the bullet. The work done by the gas on the bullet, we have already determined in the first part. Okay. The second interaction is the work done by the bullet against the atmosphere. W bullet on atmosphere. 
and since it is pushing back the atmosphere that work can also be calculated it is uh, uh, the pressure of the atmosphere multiplied by the uh, volumetric displacement of the atmosphere the volumetric displacement of the atmosphere is the swept volume by the bullet which is the volume of the barrel so, these two work interactions are involved. There is a possibility of an interaction between the bullet and the barrel, but we are told that the bullet is a frictionless bullet, the interaction is frictionless. So, there is no work interaction and we make a minor assumption that there is no heat interaction either. So, in which case we end up with uh, delta E plus W for the bullet is 0 we are neglecting any heat interaction and delta E is essentially the change in kinetic energy of the bullet. The W turns out to be the net interactions between the bullet and the gas on the chamber side and the gas on the atmospheric side. That is how we solve the problem. Over to you. Uh, so, so, in that uh, question, so you have talked about the optimum length. So, what is the significance of the op optimum length? Uh, okay, uh, if you r obtain an expression for the velocity of the bullet, the question then arises is if I use different lengths of the barrel, that means different values of Vb, how does different uh, values of uh, volume of the barrel, capital Vb, how does the muzzle velocity of the bullet change? Uh, it is possible that as you start increasing the uh, value of the barrel volume or length of the barrel, the velocity of the bullet will start increasing because now more work is done on the bullet by the gas in the chamber. It expands over a larger volume. But then it is possible that as the pressure in the chamber after expansion becomes very low, at some stage that may even fall below the atmospheric pressure. If that happens, the bullet will, gets, uh, will get retarded and you will find that an increase in the barrel volume will actually decrease the muzzle velocity of the bullet. Okay. That is what I wanted you to explore, obtain an expression for V b in term uh, uh, V naught that is muzzle velocity of the bullet in terms of the chamber pressure, initial chamber pressure which remains fixed, atmospheric pressure which remains fixed, the velocity of the chamber V c which remains fixed, but velocity of the barrel which is changing. And then you see whether at uh, you know uh, since it is an analytical expression you can differentiate it with respect to V b. Uh, and see whether at some value of Vb the differential becomes 0. Check whether it is a maximum or a minimum. If it is a minimum, uh, it is a maximum that means there is an optimal velocity of the barrel at which the bullet will reach a maximum velocity. Any increase in the length beyond this particular length is likely to reduce the muzzle velocity of the bullet. We want our guns to fire our bullets at the maximum possible velocity, so that number one the range is large enough and number two the effect where the bullet reaches is the appropriate effect, good effect. So, we want a high muzzle velocity that is why this question is asked. Over to you. There is one more question sir, whether every isolated system is a rudimentary system? Well, an isolated system is a system which has no interaction. So, uh, uh, classification of rudimentary system and simple system are the possibilities. An isolated system is kept isolated by design. A system inherently is not isolated. For example, uh, you take a gas in a cylinder piston arrangement. I can have a stirrer, I can have that piston moving up and down, I will have two work modes. Okay. If I remove the, um, the stirrer, I still have one two way work mode. I freeze the piston, I will have uh, a zero two way work mode. So, if I say freezing the piston, 
then only one uh, property of significance will remain. Then I have constrained it to be a rudimentary system. I do not even have to make it isolated to make it a rudimentary system. Okay. An isolated system is created or thought about, a system does not by itself remain an isolated system. For example, uh, we are perhaps getting into some philosophy here, but if you have a system which is essentially isolated that means inherently isolated, that means it can have no interaction, it can have no work interaction, no heat interaction and if a system is incapable of having a heat interaction, then we cannot apply zeroth law to it and hence that means we cannot determine its temperature. In fact, such questions were initially raised when black holes and the science of physics of black holes were uh, was developed. In fact, there are quite a few papers discussing whether black hole should have a temperature or not. Because if black hole has a temperature, then the laws of radiation would say that it would start radiating energy out. And if it starts radiating energy out and if it gets absorbed somewhere, then it is possible that uh, the state will change. And if it has a temperature and an interaction, then it will have something like an entropy and all those effects will come up. So, an isolated system is something which we only think about because an inherently isolated system will, will be even worse than a rudimentary system. We cannot define its, cannot even define its temperature. And an isolated system will have, if you say it has no interaction, then we will not even be able to detect that isolated system. Why do I say that this bottle exists? Because I have a visual interaction with it. If the bottle were really isolated, it, I would not even have a visual interaction with it. How do I know that the bottle exists? So, if you start really thinking about isolated, not just thermodynamically isolated, but really physically isolated systems, we are getting into danger zones. I think it is past 5.45 pm. Thank you and have a nice evening and night. Thank you.